Welcome to a special episode of This Catholic Life. This is the New Year's Eve edition, or the New Year edition. So our conversations, which are normally about life's ups and downs, big and small, and how we deal with every situation imaginable, very much come up at New Year's. New Year's is a time when we reflect on all of those ups and downs through the year, whatever life threw at us this year, and look forward to what life looks like throwing at us next year. But we still manage somehow to be sensible, practical, and joyful about it. Today's show, New Year's, is going to be a conversation about New Year's resolutions, Catholics, how it fits in, and where God fits into this whole starting out again thing. I'm your host, Peter Holmes, and today I'm joined by Beth Wells. Hello. (laughs) And by Bishop Richard Umbers, Auxiliary Bishop of Sydney. Great to be here. Um, Before we get started, just a reminder that if you like the show, you should subscribe on your podcast app and that way you won't miss an episode. Okay, let's get into this. New Year's Eve. It's not really a Catholic festival, is it? Because we had our New Year's back at the start of Advent. That's when the church year starts over again. So, Well, you can celebrate the divine maternity. Oh, so when's that? 1st of January. There, there we go. It's a solemnity I for the mother of God. I a Catholic. I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> I don't know what everyone else is celebrating. I know what I am. Uh, there you go. Well, New Year's Day hasn't been a good one for me in my younger days, uh, usually because of New Year's Eve. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't quite up to it. What about you, Beth? Have you had any particular traditions of New Year's Eve or your memories? Or um, I've always tried to make to get out of the house, essentially, <laughs> so... I remember when I was about 16, I'm sitting under the Harbour Bridge watching the fireworks and it was seedy. <laughs> it's just, oh my goodness. I had a few drinks, but like, you know, nothing too bad. And then as you get a bit older, um, sort of spending it with friends, we did um, one year, it was quite fun. We were sitting at the lookout at Ball's Head and we were sitting there from about, I think about 3 p.m. trying to keep our spot, which, you know, it was just burning in the sun and everything like right. that. But um, we even managed to make a barbecue. Like, it was such a it was such a fun day. And then we ended up having the, obviously, the um, fireworks at midnight. So I was really surprised. My husband told me he's never actually celebrated New Year's. Wow. <laughs> I was I was horrified because I'm a total party, party animal. And he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's um, you know, a bit more, I think, uh, contemplative. So this year we'll... we'll definitely be celebrating it. I, I tend to drag him around a bit, so wow. and he's very, very tolerant. Yeah, so we'll be visiting some friends, hopefully, um, down in Wagga and having a really big three-day sort of party. Um, and of course, my life is slowing down a bit, so we, <laughs> we've got to slow down of a bit. Of course, of course, yeah. <laughs> so, not so much drinking. Yes, no, not so much. Uh, maybe a mocktail <laughs> or two, let's there see. There you go. <laughs> what about you, from your memories of childhood or coming up in more recent times? Probably less partying more recently, but... Ooh. Well, actually, <laughs> now, now the other stories come out. Well, no, in fact, the stories are that it, I'd, I'd celebrate with a half-hour meditation preached by a priest. Oh, wow! On the new year, new struggle. What time would this be? In the evening, right. vig- on the vigil. Okay. Uh, followed by a solemn benediction. Right. And then a bit of a countdown with a, you know, small drink. Right. That, <laughs> that, that that would be how I'd celebrate the, yes. welcoming the new year in. Yes. The word small there was in inverted commas. <laughs> uh, but uh, but of late, of late though, I've been attending um, clerical parties. Right. So we would get together with a few priests and talk theology. Right. So it, it, this is just, really wild it's, stuff. Yeah, it's wild stuff. It's just happening. Yeah. Out of control. <laughs> I, I, mean, I had a variety of things as a... As um, brethren, as I grew up, we didn't do any of these kinds of things. So we just kind of, we only got a television when I was 16. So we never saw the fireworks and then they're in black and white, which, God, I feel old. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. We never really celebrated. So as soon as I left home, of course, I did all the things that I was forbidden from doing, uh, which is get, um, you know, roaring drunk (laughs) and get into these things. And as I think the word seedy was exactly the right word, Beth. Um, it was just a world, like I tried it once or twice. I think I've only been really drunk about twice. Mm-hmm. The first time I thought, why would <laughs> anybody do this to themselves? This is just so insane to completely impair your judgment, make poor decisions, um, place yourself in grave danger and feel awful mm. um, for, for most of the time. There's a brief moment where you're thinking everything's fine, but then Buzz. mostly it's awful. <laughs> and I think I just couldn't understand it. And then I did, uh, you know, never had more than a one drink um, for a little while. And then I got to a stage where I was really, really depressed, had a, had more than one drink. Someone said, you, you need a drink. That sounds like a great idea. 
got really drunk again. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> this was about 10 years later. No, five years later. And, uh, and then I remembered why this was a really, really bad idea. I don't think I've ever been like, much of a drinker ever since. Mm. Just, But seeing so many people just get smashed on that, where even if you don't drink yourself, you go to a party and there's people just, this seems to be a you know a thing to do, get really, really drunk. Mm. Um, well, I wonder sometimes whether that's a substitute for having personality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, people find it difficult to socialise. And right. in lieu of having to come up with some kind of conversation, right. you just have to go, yeah, mate, yeah, 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 right, yeah, <laughs> mate, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're um, you're indicating a certain type of uh, social location. <laughs> However, what I've seen is that even quite quite respectable people, and not that the people who speak like that aren't respectable, but there's people who speak quite um, civilized. You know, university lecturers, all kinds of like. I worked for a bank for a while. I thought it was a respectable institution until I went to a New Year's party. There's people just seem to measure their their fun the next day by how badly off they are having drunk quite so much it's this i don't know if it's still the same but when i was growing up it was how drunk you were is the measurement of what sort of time you had mm. and it it strikes me as being a, a peculiar way to to deal with this whole phenomenon of new year cuz you mentioned uh, the difference between partying beef and and sort of a contemplative thing I end up doing both because mm. I, I like the company of people early in the evening, but I prefer to slip away and really reflect on the year and, and what's coming up next year at, towards the end. And if anything, talk to one, maybe one person or two, two yeah. people at the end. There's something, I mean, maybe it's just self-indulgent, but there's something really quite cathartic about sort of laying out the year on the table and really having a good look at it and then sort of waving it goodbye. What about New Year's resolutions? Have you ever indulged in these things? Yeah, I've, I've had a few. It's always um, drop 10 kilos every year. Um, <laughs> I think I did it once. I was like, yes. This year as well, I had a bit of an artistic goal. Um, and I was just actually reflecting on it uh, recently going, how did I go this year? Um, so I was supposed to enter five art comps. I entered one. So that was pretty good, better right, than none. Okay. Um, I was supposed to get it on the floor at least once. Unfortunately, I didn't. Right. <laughs> no, it was good. It, I had another one um uh, kind of relating to it, which was like kind of being a bit more open to people and listening a bit more. And mm -hmm. I think I did a little bit better with that this that year. That one's hard to measure though, isn't it? That's true. Yeah. It's not exactly a smart goal, you know, <laughs> but um, mm. I, I feel like I was a little bit more listening a little bit more. And I also um, wanted to sketch a bit more in public because I can be a little bit shy about it. Right. And was, I've, I've done that a little bit more and, you know, like I'll have a little less time in the future. So that I think that was really helpful to to do. And yeah, so and we also see in January how many people are in the uh, gym because that always gets very crowded the first two weeks. <laughs> oh dear, I cancelled my gym membership a month ago. So <laughs> I, just, I haven't been there for six months. I'm paying this. Uh, mm. Just need to go. What about you? Well, I think with resolutions, in theory, they're fine, especially after a period of prayer. Right, you're ready to be the next you know, uh, canonized <laughs> saint for Australia. But we, you know, there's enormous difference between that and, and the resolution carried out in practice. Right. Mm. And that's where we need hope yep. because what often will take place is that after a few initial efforts, look, we've got our habits. They tend to, to take over and then it's all let go of. In the spiritual life as in with even trying to get fit, lose weight, the more successful you are, the more picky you are about what you're up to. Right. So if you actually do see a loss of weight, you start to then become very serious about not eating this, exercising <laughs> that. Uh, and, and so too with, with spiritual struggle. If you see these runs on the board, then you become very uh, very aware of the occasions of sin and, and avoiding such. Mm. But when you think, look, I had a go, didn't get anywhere, what's the point? Bring on the Maccas. Yeah, it's, it's funny because it, new year resolutions seem to be almost a byword for things we say in a moment of good well, good intention and don't actually do. I n almost never hear anyone talking about New Year's resolutions in February. Like it's, it's sort of, people yeah. are just gone, you know. They they almost bemoan it. And part of that is it's interesting. You were, some of the things you were mentioning before, Beth. Some of them are measured by other people's actions, and that's probably not a wise thing to. Mm -hmm. to measure ourselves. But I remember saying, I'm going to restore this friendship or I'm going to build up this or something. 
But the actual call for that, or that it required someone else to do something, and it's not something I can control. Yeah. And so, in part, I have to restrict my my resolutions to something that I can actually do. You know, that's very stoic. Oh, yeah. But see, I can't promise to you know this is going to happen this year when in fact I'm not in control of that. Yes, I know. But but from from an ethics perspective, this is a very stoical way where you you only attend to those things that you have. Control quite unquote, over. Control over. Right. Mm. Whereas a more Aristotelian perspective would involve a little bit of risk. <laughs> mm. uh, well, unfortunately, there's a fair bit of risk in what I'm doing. <laughs> but in terms of New Year's resolutions, things that I actually hold myself accountable for, I have a melancholic personality, so I'm usually m- very, very hard on myself. So I'm my own worst enemy. Everything I do, I walk out of and think that was rubbish and, and I'm c- criticizing myself. So I have to actually force myself to be realistic about my goals and say what's actually likely to be achieved so uh, i think you mentioned the whole setting high goals before sometimes especially in prayer life i'll say i'm going to pray the office three times a day all the time and the full office none none of this pansy you know <laughs> none of this pansy <laughs> yeah, angela yeah, yeah. stuff and, and then you do it for a day and then the next day oh, and just oh gee i forgot midday prayer and then it, it goes quite quickly but if you set a realistic sort of step then he can actually have some success, and well, that, that's where you know people talk about life coaches, <laughs> <laughs> someone else to tell you what to do, more or less, isn't more that, or less. Isn't you know, that someone the role who's there, you know, but, no, but accompaniment, uh, encouragement, right. you know, a, a wise, a wise uh, guide. Mm. So that's where spiritual direction obviously plays yeah. a role in this, and it depends on the spiritual director because there are mm. younger ones who perhaps are a bit too gung ho. But the older ones, the older <laughs> ones, they, my bias is always for the older ones. You know, they've, they've seen it all. They know it all. And, yeah. you know, it, it, it is there, the, the wise guide that, mm. that, 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 that just keeps encouraging. Or you could get married because uh, that's uh, an endless supply of advice on how you could improve yourself. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a shout out to my lovely wife. Um, <laughs> well, no, that's what I always put this as an example in preaching to uh, when it comes to making that kind of examination of conscience. Well, where do I need to improve? What do I need to do? Mm. And it is a gift or, or it is a grace of the Holy Spirit to see something of yourself. You know, mm. it's that, that light. Mm. Uh, and it's a difficult one in our own age where we have lost the sense of sin because our own pride gets in the way many times. If I was to acknowledge something, a specific action or a specific omission as a sin, well, then it would be incumbent upon me to actually do something, do about, something about that, to change. That. Mm. And, that you know, mm, not so sure about that. So <laughs> it's much easier to declare oneself a sinner in general mm. rather than in particular Mm -hmm. and it's even more difficult to have somebody else tell you that you are a sinner in a particular yeah it's interesting you say that because as a lutheran they have a a general absolution in each each uh, eucharistic uh, celebration and i thought i was and they also have specific confession absolution for people who feel particularly burdened by a particular sin but not very often i have to say that you front up for that sort of thing when i became a catholic it's still quite confronting to step in and say i did this oh yeah However, I have to say, it also is profoundly relieving. Like it's just the the relief and the release from the that that I can let that go and walk away and say, now I'm changing with God's help, etc. That's an amazing thing, and it, it it's a trade off. If you you don't get that without naming it and putting it forward. Mm-hmm. Coming back to the the New Year's thing, my ideal New Year's Eve is sitting with someone who knows me well, and actually jointly going over various things in the year and having that full examination and them actually calling me out on some things that I didn't see, but also help calling me out when I've gone too far and actually critis- you know, being too critical of myself. And the realism of looking back, then putting it aside and saying, what, what are we hoping for? And, and putting it together. So having that genuine sort of deep conversation at New Year's is pretty much my favorite memories of various New Year's. I don't get it every year, but it's been special, particularly with my wife, although she, she prefers to go to bed at nine o'clock on New Year's Eve. So yeah, <laughs> that's a limited capacity. But I would I would I would actually in in homilies talk uh, on something similar to that where if you say to yourself, Well I'm a good person, I don't do anything wrong, I haven't run anyone over, I you know, didn't rob a bank, I, I say, well 
talk to your spouse, talk to your children and tell mm. them that you're an excellent person and you don't do anything wrong <laughs> <laughs> and, and see the reaction. And, and they may have one or two things to, 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 to point out. Mm. Uh, I made the mistake um, a couple of years ago of saying to all my children, what would you like to change? What would you like me to change? Just one thing this year. And I thought one was manageable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I have a few children, but I still thought one was pretty manageable across 12 months. And, um, and I, yeah, it didn't work out <laughs> as well as I'd like. <laughs> because very simple things. Oh, I would really like if we just had a specific time to play with your dad. That's something I can do. That meant that I had to have an hour each one of the children doing whatever they wanted because this was their resolution. (laughs) Now, unfortunately, the very first one of my children at that stage decided what he really wanted was for me to help him learn to ride a bike. And I didn't, you you can't help him ride a bike when I'm riding a bike. So it meant me running along behind his bike for an hour. And then the next child thought, that was awesome to watch that. I want that to happen too. (laughs) So five hours later, (laughs) yeah. It's a way to get fit, I guess. I was very fit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, no wonder you can the gym. <laughs> yes. I haven't done that for a while, obviously. But, um, yeah, it was – It's some, again, realism in, in resolutions. We, we can have a, a surge of kind of focus and hope, especially around January when things aren't quite as pressing from the office and uh, you can sort of see your way to do, oh, yeah, I could do that, I could do that, and then all the, the world crowds in again and we haven't got that time. We're still, we should say that while we're in New Year celebration, in a secular sense, we're still well within the Christmas season. So we're about halfway through the Christmas season, um, the 12 days of Christmas. So it's still part of that season of hope and joy at the coming of Christ and the new life of it. So it's kind of appropriate to be looking forward. But how has your church uh, celebrated New Year's? Um, You know, do they do a midnight mass or do they just do a a New Year's Day uh, mass or is there anything special done? Uh, my parish does a midnight mass. Right. Though I've never actually been. <laughs> it's <laughs> terrible. But uh, yeah, I definitely would love to go at some point. But I, I, they celebrate the maternity of Mary. So, and hey, what a wonderful way to start the year as well, you know. Is guess, the maternity of Mary vigil, is it on New Year's Eve? Is oh, it? that's oh. a good question. Is that? You know, Bishop? Well, is, well, the first of January. January. Yeah, first of January. Yeah. So, it'd be the so you can have a vigil mass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Or a midnight mass. It's sometimes, some places you actually have midnight mass. Right. And what, what are you doing this year? Uh, I will discover because most of the parishioners <laughs> have have Acute. long since gone somewhere else to celebrate the uh, right. the Sunday Mass or for for that right. occasion. So yeah, uh, I have to. I can't even remember what we do. I'll find out when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh. But one thing I should say, we spoke last time about the 12 days of Christmas. We did. But in fact, in the church calendar, you'll notice that the Christmas season goes all the way through to the baptism of our Lord. There you go. Oh. Huh. So, and we don't have a – is there a specific number of days in that? Mm, not so sure. Is it? It's generally – Aroundish the tenth of January or something right. like that, but there's a Sunday. That's a fair because you've got this one of the Sundays after Christmas will be for the Holy Family. Oh yes, yes. Oh. And then you're going to have another. So, so like there's the the, the uh, liturgy is actually mm. uh, following through in, in different feasts there. One of the things that I I realised I didn't like about the party culture of New Year's is it tended to be about me having a good time rather than me re revisiting those things which were central to my life and the most important things and refocusing. So once I had a family, I actually stopped looking for parties and I looked for ways to bring them into the celebrations. Mm. Um, and it's a little, it's a little difficult. We, got, we, we sometimes get together with other families and there's a kind of a cycle of it. We, we, I remember actually one time a whole bunch of us were in one place and we all – move towards the nine o'clock fireworks. And after the nine o'clock fireworks, a whole range of the primary school children then got shuffled off to various sleeping arrangements. <laughs> and in the corners over there, when the rest of the party sort of moved to another part of the house and we continued on to the 12 o'clock mark. But in terms of coming back to family rather than sort of going out of our way to meet strangers on New Year's Eve, it seems a bit strange in that respect. Um, maybe I'm being a bit too judgmental of that. And it, it, there's nothing wrong with a party. Catholics are all about a party provided it actually is focusing us on what we're rejoicing about and hopeful about, I guess. When I was living in Spain uh, and in Italy, they would take um, 
I suppose, great del- sort of interest in the fact that in the Anglo-Saxon world, we celebrate bank holidays, <laughs> <laughs> whereas they have feasts of saints. Right. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's not just Anglo-Saxon. Australia is pretty secular like that. So, the, you know, the Labor Days and the, yeah. the holidays are... Yeah, I've noticed a lot of atheists aren't keen to give up their religious holidays, though. <laughs> I mean, they, maybe they'll take something But else. there's still something there where, it, I, I mean, I do like the idea that the, the whole secular world stops and revolves around a, a, a church feast. Right. Mm. Still. It's still pretty cool, isn't it? But um, it's interesting that there are other things that sort of infiltrate or, or find their way into the church culture. So, for example, Mother's Day and Father's Day you'll often see a Mother's Day blessing or something come at the end of a Mass Uh, or or a Father's Day blessing. Nothing wrong with that. Mums are great. Fathers are great. Mm -hmm. They're definitely a part of our understanding of life. Well, it's a bit like having flags in church or or patriotic songs and... Yeah, um, that's a. I think that's going a step differently because there's absolutely everything Catholic about being a mum and a dad, right? But the country's in the the Mass. Exactly. So I'm I'm saying that in a negative way. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. that, that, That really... We can tend to be a, a little too bourgeois in, in how we go about <laughs> things, and, and you know, and and also, you know, you, yep. I mean, you have the joke about it's well, it's you know, it's, it's dishwashing, put the the plastic bag away Sunday, right? Um, and then what's you know, when do we ever get to celebrate ordinary time? Yes. <laughs> well, ordinary times are an interesting concept. People go, what, what's it for? And you go. It's just ordinary time. It's for catechesis. It's for, you know, plodding our way through the normal part of the year. Uh, and without ordinary time, feast times don't make sense. Yeah. So if you're going from feast to feast, we're basically like the shops who are looking for the next reason to try and sell us something. <laughs> yeah. Although so in I, the old calendar, it's, um, was it Sundays after Pentecost, I believe? Mm. Which is quite interesting. But it, my, my own impression is uh, they're very into um, following the liturgy and following the normal cycle. Right. And and so when, when something does come up on a, on a Sunday of any particular, even the parish feast, their preference is for the Sunday readings and for the, <laughs> you know, let's, you know, it's there for a reason. Yep. Let's follow that. Mm. Um, I admit that I'm I'm keen on that myself, but that's mostly because there's, there's little enough of, especially the Old Testament, but little enough of the scriptures encaptured in the lectionary that when they're shoveling, shoving parts of it aside for a, a special feast, you end up missing whole chunks that are really important, especially if it's going like a sequence because you go through Isaiah or you'll go through, um, you know, one of the Paul's epistles or something like that. And if you miss a chunk, it doesn't make sense. Well, when we, when we seek to celebrate in the parish, uh, we will at times turn to a celebration of the uh, Liturgy of the Hours. Right. So especially with some of the... Um, uh, Holy Week feast, so, so Good Friday, Holy Saturday, we have the custom in our parish of the Office of Readings being uh, right. publicly. Mm-hmm. That's lovely. I was very blessed when I was a Lutheran to, to be near, a, um, well, within drive of a, an abbey, and I would, whenever I could, I would drop in for their prayers, and Office of Readings was glorious mm-hmm. just to see them. It was very simple chant, but it was beautiful. So we mentioned that we're still in the Christmas season, but we're leading up to Epiphany. As part of the New Year sort of cycle, as we come out of New Year's Eve to New Year's Day and we're looking forward to, to Epiphany, let's bring the liturgical calendar into this. What, what is actually happening at Epiphany? What's it about and, and what is it that we're focusing on there? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the gospel is good news Yep, and it is for everyone. So although salvation comes from the Jews, it is through that chosen people that we are all uh, called into communion with Christ, to baptism. Mm. So the connection there is that the Epiphany is the feast of the three wise men who come from afar and they're non-Jews and they've been attracted by this this sign in the heavens. And so they're a kind of an icon of the rest of the world who see the star of Christ. This is the manifestation of yeah. Christ to the peoples. Yeah. And as foretold in the scriptures, especially mm. Isaiah. Yes. You know, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Yes. And and also Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament's his handiwork. So you've we've got basically it's a call. So New Year's Eve is, is a kind of a renewed hope in the gospel and, and that the gospel goes out and that there's no one who it's not inviting. What about you, Beth? In terms of looking forward from New Year, is there something secular or or um, faith based that uh, strikes you at that part of the year? I think the rest that you finally get a little <laughs> bit. Um, you know, uh, when I was uh, working, it would be that sort of office shutdown um, after Christmas. Mm-hmm. 
to, depending on how nice the workplace was, uh, to about the sixth. My husband's a teacher, so we're sort of looking forward to a bit of a break. He's a bit tired at the moment. He, or he's recovering at the moment. And yeah, it's I, I really quite enjoy that. And then that's the sort of time I can sort of sit and think a little bit and sort of start to rearrange my life a little bit more. Um, I'm a bit hesitant to make goals this year because we've got such a you know, huge shift in our life about to happen. Mm. Um, but I, I was thinking just small manageable ones might help as well. Definitely planning for the year. Our, our in, uh, my in-laws actually um, sent out a calendar for the first half of the year so we know what they're up to and, oh, wow. you know, when they can babysit, uh, all that sort of <laughs> stuff. So it's, yeah, it's a, definitely a time of planning, which I find really quite helpful for myself as well. And yeah. It's nice. Fun. Yeah, very secular, but <laughs> well, from I mean, from a human perspective, we we need rhythm in our life. Yes, mm-hmm. and this creates something of a rhythm. Uh, more and more, work is so all encompassing. Mm-hmm. You know, we 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 fill up every little gap, and and even even January mm-hmm. might be at, at stake. So, whatever we can do to to have you know, the, not just the periods of intense work, but also periods of downtime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we have to almost fight to keep downtime. Yeah. yeah. My wife listening to this is going to be going, poking me. Going, <laughs> see, see, because uh, just after New Year's Eve, um, very early in that week, I'm off to New Zealand to do some more teaching. So oh. <laughs> spending a couple of weeks in New Zealand and then yeah. coming back to start work again. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, well, because you feel, because we've got summer school, yeah. we've got, you know, there's, yeah. You can squeeze a little bit more in. Mm. I think people find it hard to unwind from work. It was funny. It took me a couple of months after I finished working. And imagine just someone, you know, who works constantly, I guess like yourself, Peter, mm. just un- trying to take two weeks to unwind, but then you just back in again. It's- it takes it takes me a week to wind down. Yeah. And then a week I start winding back up again yeah. a couple of days before I go back to work. So I actually have to plan two more weeks than my leave in order to have a time to wind down. So, wow. Wow. Um, I usually I try to take my leave in four week blocks so that I wind down and then <laughs> spend a couple of yeah. weeks just hanging out with the kids doing nothing, or we go away with some friends or something like that, and then um, we yeah we can, I wind myself back up. But um, that's because I'm a workaholic. Then maybe that's my New Year's resolution for this year that I have to actually say no to a few more things. And and uh, it's probably not the right year to do it, though, with the plenary council coming <laughs> up and other things. So. So well, you see, there's the 2020 vision. So <laughs> There you go. I've got to get that pun in. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be hearing it over and over. Oh, we year. will. You're right. 2020 vision. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's probably a good time to wrap it up. With 2020 vision, what do we have the world to offer the world at New Year is this um, vision for of hope and uh of the joy of the gospel spreading to the whole world. Um, That's it for this week's podcast. If today's discussion got you thinking or arguing with your podcast device, let us know. You can subscribe to our podcast at thiscatholiclife.com.au or you can drop us a line at info at thiscatholiclife.com.au. Remember that this is a uniquely Australian Catholic podcast and we think that's an idea worth getting behind. So tell your friends. Before we go, it's time for shout-outs. What do you think, Beth? Who are you shouting out to at New Year's? Um... I would say my mother-in-law, who's been so helpful this year, and I think she'll be very, very helpful next year. <laughs> so she's been a wonderful support. Oh, wow. I'm very, very blessed with her. So um, she also looks after my cat, Jelly Bean, quite frankly. Am I allowed to shout out to my cat, Jelly Bean? Though? You can do that. <laughs> Hi, Jelly Bean. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bishop. And a shout out to all the staff at the Polding Centre. So hopefully They'll every night a happy and holy break. Indeed. And I'd like to shout out to those people who've shared New Year's with me over the years. Um, we, some of them I haven't caught up with since that time, uh, but a profound change of my life. I can still remember each conversation I've had at New Year's. Uh, you, your contributions are very much treasured and have changed things. So thank you very much for that. That's all for now. This Catholic Life wishes you all a, a safe and happy, joyful and hopeful New Year. Thank you for listening to This Catholic Life. Mm-hmm.